The truth is, I love good food and lots of it at any time, but I know too that at the end of a long day, cooking can seem just like another exhausting chore. So what we need is a sort of simple food you can face cooking on those days when you just have to hit that kitchen running. doing the shoot for the book. Now we're day seven, it's a 10 day shoot. We've done so far, I'd say 80 rolls of film, it's about 3,000 pictures. So we're all feeling a bit frazzled, which is why I have to comb my hair for a week. Mozzarella and carrozza is the ultimate TV dinner. It's quick to make, you eat it with your hands, and the really useful thing is, the few ingredients you do need, you can just pop out in your lunch hour and buy milk. Now, all you do is make sandwiches with this very nice Italian bread, as you can see. I mean, I'm sure the Italians don't use plastic bread, but it works very well. Crusts off. This makes a great sort of quick tea for children when they come back from school, because it doesn't take long to make and they love it. It's like, I suppose, pizza sandwich. You could put some tomato in, I suppose. Just going to put the oil in the pan now because these don't take long to make. Jackson Pollock with the oil here. Now, you just use ordinary mozzarella. You don't need to get that expensive buffalo mozzarella because, if anything, the point about this sandwich is you don't want it too milky and liquid and you want this to be melting and gooey, but you don't want it actually to make the bread too damp inside. OK, slice this. Doesn't matter how you slice it because you're only making sandwiches. Quite small pieces is good, it helps the stringiness. The rather good thing about this bread is that because it's so pappy, you can kind of wadge them sealed shut at the outside, a bit of kind of like pappy mache work. You know, these are not meant to be perfect 1980s specimens. They're just, it's just kind of quick food on the run. Right, milk first. Uh, flour. It doesn't really matter, I mean, how much. I use three spoons, but I mean, it's just to dredge them in. And egg. Now this is my favourite little implement. It's cheap. It's called a magic whisk or a magic whisk, whatever. It's from France. And it takes lump out of any sauce, and it's very good just for whisking up eggs or anything. A bit of pepper and salt just for seasoning. Because mozzarella actually is quite bland. I mean, that's what's nice about it in a way. Which is why also I think this is wonderful with chilli either in it or like Tabasco dripped on top afterwards. Now I'll just kind of show the sandwich to the milk because this bread is really absorbent and you don't want a kind of liquid sludge. In the flour, in the egg, and in the pan. Okay, I'm going to carry on with these ones. I first had mozzarella and carrozza when I was a chambermaid in Italy. What it means, I surmised, was mozzarella in a carriage. This doesn't tell you a great deal, um, but I suppose it just means that it's contained. Now these just need to be fried until they're golden on the outside, and so they'll be golden and slightly crispy. I mean, not crunchy, but slightly crispy on the outside, and then really gooey and melting in the middle. As I turn, you can see where I haven't sealed the bread brilliantly some of the cheese oozing out, which is great. OK, ready? So let's cut this in half, and this is what you want. All this kind of melting gooeyness, and when it goes into spoons, look. Look at that. Cheese flavour chewing gum. I might often need to cook on the run, but I still want something really substantial, kind of supper eaten with a knife and fork. 
This is chicken chorizo and cannellini beans with a bit of kale. Very quick. Now, one of the reasons I love this, I mean, apart from the taste, is that it's so easily thrown together. Five minutes from liftoff, I reckon. It's not bad. OK, a bit of chicken stock concentrate in my simmering water. Look, I know everyone will say you have to make chicken stock from fresh and otherwise it's just despicable. It's not. I like poaching the chicken here, which is to say just cooking it in the simmering water. One, because it's very quick, but also it keeps the chicken incredibly tender. Cannellini beans. Use any beans you want. I like these. My fencing mark. I bought this um, in New York. I saw it there. I had no idea what it was for. Still don't. Of course I had to have it, even though it meant having to lug it back. Chorizo, which is just Spanish sort of paprika sausage. It used to be difficult to get. It isn't at all now. It's from the supermarket. It's wonderful. It's sort of pearled with fat. Now, because it's cured, you're just warming it through. I don't want to fry it because I don't want to seal the edges, just let everything ooze out. OK. Bit of oil in the pan, but only a bit. Just ordinary oil. This is olive oil, but not extra virgin, because this will give off some fat. And anyway, you don't want a really strong taste because the paprika will give it to you anyway. As I say, it's just warming it through and letting everything just mellow. Beautiful. I love kale. It's so kind of rich and iron heavy, which is sort of perfect with the chicken and the beans quite bland, the paprika's quite hot and the sausage. And then this really, it's almost like a meaty vegetable. So it's really just a bit of plonking about in pans. And now my fencing mask of beans. Now what happens is the paprika just oozes out of the sausage, just begins to coat some of the beans, which looks beautiful, tastes better. Perfect. Now if I can find my, put my covers in such a mess. Right. Mm. So that's the first bit. Beautiful. See how useful this fencing mask is. Luckily, I have asbestos hands. Dish this out. Beautiful, really wonderful and tender. So just the last thing, which is a bit of sweet smoked paprika on top of the chicken, which makes it look beautiful, but also it kind of brings the paprika taste again from the sausage. Although it's not hot, it's just, it's just smoky and sweet and earthy and wonderful. OK, supper. On a working day, you don't necessarily have time to shop for your supper, so it makes sense to keep things in store so you can get yourself something to eat quickly. One of my favourite puddings is vanilla ice cream with toasted pine nuts and warm honey. Now, just cook these in a dry pan, warm this in the microwave, pour them over the ice cream, and it's fabulous. My real larder standby is this marsala, which is fortified wine. And you just slosh it into any pan of meat or fish you're cooking, and you've got an instant sort of bubbling up gravy. Pasta, obviously, you know, a quick working day supper. Linguine, my favourite. And what I love this with is with garlic infused olive oil and cubes of pancetta. I mean, to be frank, it's hardly a recipe. Just three ingredients, the pasta, this pancetta, which is this Italian bacon, and some garlic-infused olive oil. You can use whatever you want, ordinary olive oil, and chop up some garlic, but this, frankly, is easier, especially after a long day at the office. Now, what I always do is cut off the rind of the pancetta, simply because if I bung it in the dish with the oil, it will give off all its fat and juices. You can buy just bits of cubes of lardon, with the French equivalent, in supermarkets that's already diced for you. Or else you can just get ordinary bacon and just cut it up. Right. Just smoosh it about a bit with your hands. I like a bit of hands-on work, and the rest isn't. Stick it in the oven. 
but 15 or 20 minutes should do it. Now, I tend to salt pasta water always at this stage. I mean, it doesn't really matter, obviously, but unsalted water comes to the boil faster than salted water, and I'm, um, I'm not a patient person. Every little helps. Right. I tend to use about the same weight of pasta as pancetta. Half packet. Might just about do me. There again, it might not. And just stir it about so it doesn't stick. Let it come up to the boil. The packet instructions say 11 minutes. So I think, well, I've got 10 minutes to forget about everything. The pancetta's in the oven. The green is in the water. I'm not needed. So I'm just going to set my alarm. 10 minutes, unwind, and slip into something a little more comfortable. Mmm. Look at that. Wonderfully bronzed and crisp, but you can still see the pink bits. Just going to take off the fat and rind to eat alone in a private later. And then we'll strain this. And now all you do is bung this in here and just mix it all up so that all those wonderful bacony, salty juices just dress the pasta. You can just see all the, the pasta darken in the sauce. And I'll just tip it into the bowl. And then I do think pasta is good. I can't really be bothered with chopping, but you can just scissor it in. And anyway, because the pancetta cubes are quite big, it's quite nice to have quite a sort of rough bit of parsley on top. Let me just have a quick Mmm. Oh. Bit of pepper. Right. Bed. Television. Food. Mimi, Bruno, breakfast ready. Cooking something at breakfast time, mad though it seems, I promise you isn't about being a kind of deranged superwoman. This is incredibly easy. It's a bit of orange ice cream and all you do is just put zest, juice, sugar, cream, whisk it and put it in the deep freeze and then when you take it out at the end of the day, you know, you've got your ice cream. I first made this ice cream with Seville oranges, which are incredible because they have the flavour of orange, but that in sour intensity of lemon. But the only thing is, you know, they're only available in January, not that useful. So I found by mixing just an ordinary sweet orange and two limes means that you get that same sourness and fragrance and hit. But, you know, you can use lemon. In fact, you could use three lemons and make a lemon ice cream. Just whatever you want, whatever you've got. You don't have to be precise about zesting, just, you know, roughly do one. What's really delicious with this bit of orange ice cream is chocolate sauce. Just put, you know, I don't know, a bar of dark chocolate and an equal weight double cream in a saucepan and melt them together. It's just delicious over it. Right, so into the zest and juice. It's about 175 grams of icing sugar, which just dissolves into the acid of the juice. And the really brilliant thing about this is that you don't have a civic, and the only kitchen job I really loathe and detest is sieving. Right, big pot of cream. Well, that's it, stir it. I mean, I'm going to whisk it in here, but to be frank, you can use just one of those little handheld electric whisks. You don't want this really thick, the soft piece.
You know, just because something is unfamiliar doesn't mean it's difficult to cook. I mean, this squid with salt and pepper is incredibly easy, very quick. And what is probably the simplest thing about it is that this is the only ingredient you need to buy and you can get it frozen and keep it in the deep freeze. The rest you're probably going to have in the house. In other words, some peppercorns. And salt, which you then very pleasurably smash to smithereens. Ah, fine. So the squid, my squidlets. Look at these babies. The baby squid is great because it's so tender. So nice little rings. Beautiful. Keep the tentacles whole and when you fry them they just swell up like chrysanthemum blossoms. Salt and pepper mixture just goes into a bit of corn flour and give it a good sort of swing around just so everything coats the squid. Oh, this is a very good part. You have got to feel a bit more relaxed at the end of the day after a bit of squelching and squeezing like this. Okay. <laughs> it. Now I'm going to turn this up. Just put a teeny bit of ring in to see if it sizzles and is ready. Mmm, that's right. You know, it's really difficult to undercook squid when it's as tender as this. And you just see when they get rosy and start kind of bulging out of the fat a bit. I just want to eat just with a lemon with this, just to maintain the zen-like purity. Right, we can tongue out. Look at this. So, just lemon. And either your fingers or my uh, special chopsticks for the eternally incompetent. The farm. The farm. Well done. If you are going to be inviting friends over in the middle of the week for supper, you really need to be sure you have food you can cook quickly, easily, and that doesn't need too much strenuous shopping. And this pumpkin and seafood curry is just that. I mean, I'm evangelical about this. Top of a can of coconut milk. The top tends to be thick like this, and then it gets sort of thin and watery underneath. Into that, I use yellow curry paste. You can use red if you want. I just love this golden color. I use two tablespoonfuls. Some like it hot, I like it very hot. I just whisk these together, and all you know, the curry paste and the thick bit of the milk will just meld together in a sort of golden, aromatic sludge. Fine. So, now, the rest of the coconut milk, can you see, look, they're running a bit. And then, a bit of fish stock, and, you know, I'm using it out of a jar. So this is all these liquid stocks that I seem to be addicted to. Put that in. Fish sauce, got my jailer's spoons, three tablespoons. Oof, although I can't be bothered to measure it. But it tastes so much of this anyway. Right, spoonful of sugar, just to balance the sort of sweet sour intensity. Turmeric. Really, this is just to enhance the kind of goldenness. Mmm, lovely. Lime leaves, just snip them in. Lemongrass. Now, I like this bit. You have to bruise the lemongrass, by which I mean put the flat of the knife on and press down. And then kind of helps that lovely, gentle sourness permeate that broth. So, just bring this to the boil and get on with the pumpkin. You can use butternut squash if you want, whatever's easier. You need a kilo, which sounds like a hideous amount, but in fact, it's only these two pieces by the time you've peeled and seeded. 
I often do a vegetarian version of this, and for myself too, and I am no vegetarian. Simply, instead of fish stock, I use vegetable stock, and in place of the seafood, a few cans of drained chickpeas. It's really fabulous. Oh, so beautiful as well. I mean, that's sort of got to cheer you up. Okay, in with the pumpkin. Why I like this particularly is what I find when you invite people around for supper, especially after work, they uh, tend to be late. And what you do with this is you just cook the pumpkin until it's tender. And it's so hard to say when that is because some seem to take five minutes, some 15. But once you've done that, you can turn it off and leave it because the fish that's going in later will take five minutes. Well, pumpkin's about tender. All that happens now is you plonk in 500 grams thereabouts. It's a pound in old money. This is wonderful fish for curry because it's so robust and it can really hold up to it well. Prawns. Now, the only thing I'm going to be really bossy about here, and I mean it, is these prawns have to be raw. Just don't even bother with cooked prawns. Just leave them out in that case. This will take about, I don't know, three to five minutes. Not too demanding. Bring up to the boil. Let these cook. So that's going to take hardly any time. So just so I can keep busy, I'm going to chop some coriander for later now. Perfect. That's done. Veg. I like these packets of pak choy you can get, but you can really use any vegetables you want. And in fact, I sometimes use those you know, already topped and tailed fine beans. They'll need longer than the pak choy, which really just needs to be wilted. So let it come back to the boil and you're done. Bit of tamping down. Give it a minute if that. Oh, glorious. Got a taste for the seasoning. Mm -hmm. mm, lovely. But I think be even more wonderful. Just a teeny weeny bit of lime juice and it will sing. So, what I've got to do now, dish it up. Little fragrant last minute sprinkling of coriander. We're away. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.